Good afternoon. afternoon. Welcome to St. Paul's. I am not Pastor Nelson, nor am I Pastor Schmidt. Uh, My name is Micah Plucker. I am privileged to serve God's people at Trinity Lutheran in Nicollet, and it's a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon to worship our God and to walk with him on the road to redemption. Uh, You see all that you need to follow along with our service in your uh, bulletin, your service folder, and also on the screen behind me. Let's begin as printed with the opening responses. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. Surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. On no day will the gates of the holy city ever be shut, for there will be no night there. We sing our hymn, Glory Be to Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Father, I have sinned against you, and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only Son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in the joy of your Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks Amen. Be to God. Amen. We continue by reading together portions of the Passion History of our Lord as printed on pages 4, 5, and 6. Simon Peter and another disciple kept following Jesus. That disciple was known to the high priest, so he went into the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. But Peter stood outside by the door, so the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and talked to the girl watching the door, and while Jesus was in the Warming himself too. 
One of the servant girls of the high priest came there. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. At that very moment, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the Lord's word, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He went outside, broke down, and wept bitterly. If I said something wrong, Jesus answered, testify about what was wrong. But if I was right, why did you hit me? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I place you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of, the, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said, but I tell you, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, you have just heard the blasphemy. What do you think? As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both chief priests and experts in the law. He said to them, I am what you are saying. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. 
He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put these into the treasury since it's blood money. They reached the decision to buy the potter's field with the money as a burial place for foreigners. So that the Lord has had to follow the Lord of blood to this state, and then what was spoken to Jeremiah and the prophet was the Lord. They took the dirty pieces of silver, the price the sons of Israel had set for him, and they gave them for the potter's field, just as the Lord. Early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. They did not enter the praetorium themselves so that they would not become ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. It is as you say, Jesus replied. Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I answered, and I too, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have I done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies of each other. Here ends the Passion History reading. We continue by singing the verses of our hymn, Behold Redemption's Road.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture that will be the basis for our meditation this evening is found in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. So far, God's word. In the, in the musical Hamilton, uh, the title character, Alexander Hamilton, he sings a line, In the eye of a hurricane, there's quiet. And he's right. <laughs> I've never actually been in the eye of a hurricane, grew up in the Midwest, lived here basically my whole life, but I've watched YouTube. And if you ever do find yourself in the eye of a hurricane, you'll look around and you'll see sun shining, a, lo- a light breeze wafting through the air, and pretty much a nice day except for the 10 or 20 miles away, the walls of towering thunderstorms in every direction. Alexander Hamilton saw himself in the eye of the hurricane. He'd just gone through one storm wall, uh, accusations to which he had admitted wrongdoing that would derail his career and possibly tarnish his legacy. And he knew that another storm was coming when he'd have to to deal with the repercussions of all of that. But for now, quiet, calm, planning, preparation for the moment when he would launch into furious action and response. Today we follow our Savior Jesus into the eye of the storm. A storm of accusation and anger rages around him, but Jesus is quiet, stunningly silent. But this isn't surprising to us. Because as we follow the road to redemption back into the Old Testament, we see that this is always where the road was going to lead from silence to silence. And it's a good thing it does. Because it accomplishes, it accomplishes for us the greatest good, not only our salvation, which is by far the greatest, but also, also Jesus' silence gives us the power, the motivation to stand amidst life's storm and to face it in quiet, peace, and trust. We just read the account in our Passion history, didn't we? Picture Jesus there in front of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. He's been unceremoniously yanked from his prayer and meditation in the Garden of Gethsemane, kind of probably none too gently transported to this midnight kangaroo court. And the accusations and the anger rages around him. They bring every single thing they can accuse him for. They bring every single person who's ever seen him speak or listened to him teach. They're hurling whatever they can at him just to see if they can get something to stick, twisting his words, bringing downright false witnesses so they can find something, anything to accuse him of, to condemn him for. But in all of it, Jesus says, Nothing in response. Finally, it must have been unnerving for Caiaphas, the high priest, because he asks Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? But still, Jesus remained silent. He gets kind of kicked down along the road, right? He ends up at Herod's palace in front of him. Picture him there. The Jewish leader is still standing in the background, hurling 
their accusations. Jesus, bruised, bound, standing in front of the Galilean king. He's excited. Excited to see Jesus. He's wanted to get to talk to this miracle worker he'd heard so much about, who'd been so active in his territory. He plies him with many questions. Maybe he can see a miracle himself, but Jesus, again, remains silent. So Herod sends him back to Pilate. Here Jesus stands before the man who holds his life and death in his hands. The accusations and the anger are still in the air, rising, uh, rising in tempo, rising in volume. Crucify him, crucify him. Still, silence. Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But still, Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. And that amazed Pilate. He had no idea why, why Jesus would remain silent. As a storm of accusation and anger rages violently around Jesus, he is silent. But, but unlike Alexander Hamilton, Jesus is not in the eye of the storm. He's not just biding his time, not just waiting, plotting for the perfect opportunity, the perfect moment to launch into action, to launch his defense, no. Jesus isn't in the eye of the storm. He is the eye of the storm. Wherever he goes, whether it be to the Sanhedrin, to Herod, to Pilate, he brings with him quiet, calm, commitment to one thing, establishing justice. When you think about what it takes to establish justice where it is lacking. Where does silence rank on your list? If you're going to uh, have a ranked list of the most essential things for establishing justice, does silence even make the top 20? Because uh, when you see injustice, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to point it out. You're supposed to bring attention to it. You're not supposed to let it remain hidden. You're supposed to bring it to the light. Bring the storm to those people who are acting so unjustly. You see that a lot these days, right? When injustice comes to light, whether real or imagined, the Twitter storm, the uprising of outcry, the, the protests, right? We've seen it. But not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. He becomes the victim of injustice, right? But he remains silent. He remains silent because he's not interested in justice for him. He's interested in justice for you. In Isaiah chapter 42, we're introduced to a, a figure identified there only as the servant of the Lord. This is the one that God has chosen, the one that God has sent for his purpose of establishing justice on earth. But he won't do it with vehement responses. He won't do it with violent resistance. He'll do it with silence. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Even with a storm of injustice raging around him, he doesn't speak up to defend himself. He doesn't insist he's never done anything wrong, never sinned, even though it's true. Jesus remains silent. Because he's not standing there in front of the Sanhedrin, or in front of Herod, or in front of Pilate. Not standing there to get what he deserves, but to take what you deserve. See, Jesus looks at you and he sees a bent reed and a smoldering wick. Bent, unable to hold yourself upright, bent by your sin and your injustice, the way you've lived your life, the way you are by nature, 
unable to stand up in the presence of God. Smoldering. Sputtering. Under the oppressive darkness of death always looming and hell always threatening. You aren't doing anybody any good. Least of all, your God. Jesus would have had every right, he would have been right to break off that bruised reed, to snuff out that smoldering wick. But instead, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Jesus saw your bruises and your smoldering not as something to be crushed, but as something to be saved from. He saw what your unjust nature, your unjust way of life, where it was leading you, what it was earning for you, death and hell. Instead of responding in anger and accusation, he responds in quiet, compassionate love. Even though remaining silent cost him. He knows exactly what he's there for. He knows exactly what his purpose is. He's there to make you right, to establish justice between you and your God. And so, like Isaiah writes, as the storm rages around him, he lets nothing deter him. In faithfulness, faithfulness to his mission, faithfulness to his God, faithfulness to his people, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter, he will not be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. And that's what he did. Despite the raging storm, the servant of the Lord did not stop, did not complain, did not hesitate, did not turn back all the way to the cross, even though it cost him, even though it killed him, he remained silent. And now, because of his silent suffering, his willing walk, to be your sacrifice that takes away your sins. You stand justified before God. There is justice between you and your Father in heaven. Some might look at Jesus' silence and think of it as coming from a place of, of helplessness, of weakness. And of course, Jesus is in his state of humiliation, humbling himself, weakening himself, not using his divine ability to take himself down off that cross. But I would argue that in Jesus' silence you see a better example of God's strength. It takes strength to stand amidst the raging storm, amidst accusations and arrogance and anger, and not respond with the same. It takes a strength of love to take all the sinful world through at him and return only grace. It's that grace that because of Jesus' silence is yours. And will be yours forever. And that is empowering for you and me. There's a storm that rages in your life too, isn't there? A storm of accusations, the devil's accusations, uh, whether true or false. A, a storm of injustice and anger. And it's so tempting, so tempting to jump into the storm, to fire back a quick response, to try to overshadow the injustice of my way of living by pointing out the faults that are more obvious or seem more grave in someone else's life. But that's not who you are. 
That's not who Christ has made you to be. You are the people of the silent suffering servant's grace. He has given you calm in the middle of your storm. Peace that the world can never take away. So live in him. Live in the eye of the storm that is your Savior, Jesus. Let the storm around you rage. It's going to. It's going to be loud. It's going to be violent. Let it rage. That is for you. Walk on the road to redemption that your Savior has placed you on. Follow him in peace, quiet, contentment. Follow him in faith because you know where he's leading you. Amen. Now the peace of God which goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time in our service, we would normally gather the offering. We're not going to pass our plates today, but uh, as you can see in the bulletin, there are other ways for, for you to still worship your God by giving back to him from what he has given to you. Uh, at this time, uh, we will bring forward the offering. Uh, if you have not yet done so, I invite you to take a look at those Connect cards and to fill out your information. Let us know. Us. Let Pastor Nelson and Pastor Schmidt know uh, that you worship with us today. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness I shall see you. Dearest Redeemer, in faithfulness you brought forth justice and did not falter and were not discouraged as you established justice on earth. Your weapons were not armies or battle cries, but quiet and humble obedience to the will of your Father. As a lamb before the shearers is silent, so you did not open your mouth. We pray that you will continue to be a light for the Gentiles, that you will open the eyes that are blind, free captives from prison, and release from the dungeon those who sp sit in spiritual darkness. We ask you to march out like a mighty man, and like a warrior, stir up your zeal. Raise the battle cry and triumph over your enemies. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing our next hymn.
May the blessing of the eternal God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us, his light to guide us, his presence to shelter us, his peace to unite us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming to worship with us. This, <laughs> Pastor Nelson's telling me I should go ahead and, and talk. So. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Thank you for joining uh, me this evening here at St. Paul's. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always, uh, I'm, I'm pretty new over at Nicollet. Again, my name is Micah Plucker. Uh, it's nice to get out to get to know some of the congregations in the area. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just, I'll let you know. Normally I would, I would greet you in the back here after the service, but I actually have an appointment in between the services that I need to rush off to. So uh, it's my scheduling problem. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for, for worshiping with me today. It's been a blessing.